Hello. <laughs> Can you hear me? Yeah. Well, did you enjoy that journey? <laughs> well, um, so I'm we're gonna I'm gonna start out just uh, talking a little bit about the the sort of contextualizing the geography of where the film uh, takes place um, on in the southeast. Uh, of the U.S. in South Carolina, there are islands, which are called Sea Islands, um, where uh, Africans were brought into the U.S. And it's in these islands where um, communities basically um, were separated from the mainland, and so they were um, in that way isolated, and so they maintained um, their African uh, rituals and cultures and created uh, a, a new language um, based on the complexity of the, and the diversity of the Africans that were being brought into the geography. And that's how you get what we call the Geechee Gullah um, culture. And um, these communities were um, isolated up until what the early uh, until the bridges were built, um, and that was like in the late twin nineteen twenties, early nineteen thirties. Yeah, so um, that gives you uh, also allows you to see um, how you can have such a clearly distinct uh, with language uh, and um, traditions and. In the film, you have the aspect when someone comes home and they are greeted by their um, elders or how they meet their elders. I mean, all of these kinds of things that you see are really essential f um, aspects of from the, the culture itself. Um, so... Julie, can you just go into telling us how you got to grips with this culture and provided recognition or s could see that it was a, something distinctive that you wanted to sort of engage with? Yes. Um, so my father's side of the family, um, they come from that region. And um, I was born and raised in New York. But uh, born and raised in the midst of a uh, Geechee enclave, Geechee family, relatives. And um, I knew we were very different <laughs> um, by the way the things, the way the household was run and by uh, the, the food we ate. We ate rice every day, three times a day. And as I told you the story about, um, we ate a lot of seafood and uh, we ate a lot of crabs. And my father would often come home with a big croaker sack full of live crabs and he would just release them in the kitchen so they could run free because <laughs> he was teaching us how to choose the best crabs to eat and you never want to eat a crab that's slow because <laughs> it might be dying and so that's not a fresh crab so you don't want to even bother to cook them. <laughs> so uh, little things like that let me know that we were very different. I never wanted any one of my friends from school or from the housing project where I lived to know that we had crabs running around at times. <laughs> and and we, we just did all, you know, family did all kinds of things that were just very, very non-traditional mm -hmm. in a New York City housing project apartment. Mm -hmm. um, I learned more about uh, my family's culture when I was in graduate school at UCLA and I was able to use their research libraries and be able to sit at the feet of scholars who had done a lot of research on the region. And, and I learned that this was um, uh, this very peculiar culture um, uh, came from the fact that they were so isolated and insulated for so many years. And, and it was to be celebrated, the fact that they had retained so many um, 
uh, traits and traditions and the religion mm -hmm. from uh, that had come generations before them um, because they were the descendants of the African captives who worked the land in that region. Great. And Julie, again, just as part of this journey, it was this discovery, it seems, for both yourself, uh, so take, connecting those things from your childhood, with, you know, the slow crab, don't eat that one, uh, <laughs> to your research with the Work Progress Administration from the New Deal in the 1930s that really opened up these doors to this history that is not known to many Americans. Um, and so I think that's why your film really spoke uh, beyond that subculture of America because it opened up a, a, a side of America that many Americans don't know, right? Right. It was the WPA with the work, what do you get, work projects? Work progress uh, Administration. Uh, yes. Um, uh, the government in the 1930s under FDR um, hired writers and artists uh, during the Depression to just go into the different remote regions of the United States into, you know, the Dust Bowl in Oklahoma and in, of course, to the Sea Islands of the South and to conduct oral histories. And it was from those oral histories that I was able to pull a lot of information from prim a primary source because these were direct interviews with people who were perhaps born into slavery or came over on one of the last boats that... Um, you know, full of African captives. So it's a, it's a very, those are very important documents. And um, I came across them in, at UCLA. Excellent. And just to kind of add on to that, can you, uh, so we saw the movie brings you in to the island at Ebo Landing. Can you talk to us the, the significance of some of these things, both as you saw it in your research, but also as you saw it through your family? Okay. So Ebo Landing is a site, uh, it's, Ebo Landing is such an important site in the Sea Islands of the South, and the Sea Islands runs all the way from North Carolina down to coastal North Carolina, coastal South Carolina, coastal Georgia, and coastal Florida. And it seems that there are tales of Ebo Landing and the Ebos who refused to live in slavery in every one of those states those islands, like there are hundreds of islands and every island seems to say, no, Ebo Landing is here, no, it's here, no, it's here. And the reason being is people are so proud and they hold on to that tradition of that kind of resistance. Now the story has been told many times, they, they often say that they walked on top of water and walked all the way back to Africa. Some say that they walked into the water, like I say in here, and drowned. But um, there, are also, there are also children's tales that have been written about how they came off the boats and then they flew back to Africa. That's a more gentle version of the, of the Igbo landing tale. Um, the Igbo landing tale, um, I've seen it uh, mentioned in films coming out of Britain, the UK, and, and on uh, the west coast of Africa, they're familiar with the Igbo landing tale too. So it's kind of a tale that circles you know, <laughs> that it kind of circles the world that, uh, that there is such a thing as a resistance that you would rather die and you'd rather take your family down with you and, and drown than to, than to uh, live in captivity as a slave. Yeah, and I mean, it's a beautiful loop because um, the sort of subtitle of the festival is the Black Atlantic. And um, it's a phrase coined by the sociologist, intellectual Paul Gilroy. Um, and I think it allows us to talk, just like you say, about this, this triangulation of uh, the idea of Igbo landing. Um, but when, once you started creating the story around um, Daughters of the Dust, uh, looking at the people that you put together on your team, you have a combination of artists, mm -hmm. material artists, as well as uh, cinematic artists. Um, and uh, Arthur Jaffa winning um, the Best Cinematographer um, Award at Sundance in 91. In 91 yeah. um, but you also had, as um, your production designer, Carrie James Marshall. 
Um, you also had collaboration with David Hammond and, and Michael Kelly Williams and Michael he Kelly he Williams. designed Danny's chair. Yeah. So can you talk to us briefly about how that collaboration, because it's quite unusual to have material artists as well as cinematic artists working together. You're also from the LA Rebellion. Um, Carrie Marshall was still in LA at the time when we first started taking meetings about um, putting together our team for um, Daughters of the Dust. And we knew that we wanted to do something very different. We wanted to do something that was very authentic. And as I guess everyone knows already by now, I am a fan of foreign films, you know, American films are like, eh. but <laughs> I love foreign films. And I, one of the reasons being is that um, when I go into a theater and I sit and go on a journey with a foreign film, I really feel like I've been somewhere, I've learned something, I've seen things and heard things that I, I hadn't expected or hadn't seen before. And so it was, it's, it's an experience. I wanted to do that about African American culture because I felt growing up that um, what I was seeing on television or whenever I went to the movies, it wasn't really fulfilling to me. It was like, that story is not real. <laughs> you know, it was um, it was the Hollywood version of African American life, and so I wanted to do something that was authentic to the culture, and 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 perhaps so authentic to the culture that it it would appear foreign. So, Carrie James Marshall, Michael Kelly Williams, um, Arthur Jaffa. We just, uh, we sat together, we pulled together all these images from, you know, the Suriname, as far away for, as the Suriname rainforest and uh, West Africa. What does the indigo processing plant, what did they look like in West Africa? Because we don't have, we didn't have photographs of what they look like in the United States. Mm -hmm. And we knew that they were built and cultivated by uh, African captives. So let's just go back to the source and build those, mm -hmm. you know, our indigo um um, pits mm -hmm. exactly the way they did it in West Africa. Mm -hmm. uh, and the same thing with the making the indigo blocks and all of those kinds of things. We just went back, we took a step away from gone with the wind <laughs> and, and went to the primary sources. Mm -hmm. And we created those prime, and, and we did that with the music as well. Yeah, that's right. Uh, so I had, I kind of freaked out earlier when I saw some of the subtitles saying tribal music, and it was like, tribal? <laughs> no. Um, John Barnes um, composed an original score, um, wonderful score, and we decided to create something called New World Music. And the New World com music is, is comprised of, um, of course, sounds of West Africa, but also sounds from Pakistan, sounds from Iran, sounds from um, Britain. All of these places where, during the Middle Passage, when people were chained in the, in the ships, they would have heard like the musical flutes, maybe a Sakahachi flute that someone was recreating the sound above. And those sounds would have traveled with those African captives and kind of passed down, and I'm not saying that they cultivated sounds from the other, but you know, jazz is something very different and it's something that we created. I wanted to try to create a new sound, not the traditional Hollywood sound where you have a banjo playing or someone playing a harmonica. <laughs> I wanted a new world sound, and that's what we did. So it's not really tribal music, it's, it's new world. <laughs> And before we go out to the audience, and speaking and building onto this theme of the sounds and this that the vibe that's created in throughout the film, can you speak to us a little bit about how you recreated the language? Because we all three are, are Americans, mm -hmm. and none of us sound like a peasant. And I couldn't uh, even really wrap my mind around how that really started. How did? What was that process like? Well, um, since I don't speak Gullah either, but my grandmother spoke a bit of it, and I know when growing up in New York City, people used to always ask me, where's your father from? He sounds strange. And it was like, <laughs> uh, he's from South Carolina. And we get so accustomed to seeing these films out of Hollywood where everyone has this Southern drawl. It's like Gone with the Wind has really become the the paradigm of, of what Southern life is, you know, the do-rag tied a certain mm -hmm. way and mm -hmm. ancient Mima style. And, mm -hmm. and that's 
All of that was created by a production designer or a costume or, a, or what you see coming out of Hollywood is not real, you know. So, um, so we was like, oh yeah. So the Gullah language, yes. So um, Gullah is English spoken with a West African syntax, and it is comprised of English words, various West African words, um, um, and even some Arabic words um, and it's um, and it's specific to that region and it's and it's it's a beautiful sound but uh, I don't know how to speak it so I hired um, Ronald Days mm -hmm. who was born and raised there and um, Verdame Smart Grosvenor who was also born and raised there to translate my screenplay phonetically into Gullah that had a lot of people disturbed in the United <laughs> States when they first saw this movie because they were saying, well, why would you do something like that? And it was like, well, why not? Because I listen to wonderful films that I see, Irish American accents, Chinese American accents, Italian American accents. And you know, sometimes you don't get the full sentence, you don't get it, but you get it eventually. And so I said, why, why do we always have to have a Southern drawl when that's not the way it sounds? That's not, that's not true, that's not real. Mm -hmm. I wanted something authentic and so therefore, it's in Gullah. But you guys had it easy because you, have, <laughs> you had subtitles, but um, a lot of Americans were like, I can't, I can't get it, I can't get it, you know. So uh, I'll ask one more question uh, and then we'll send it out to the floor. Um, what, can you talk to me about projects you're working on now? What are you, um, what's in your, you know, bag of tricks? Two things. <laughs> the first one is, once again, I'm doing a documentary, a biopic on Verda May Smart Grosvenor, who was born in the Sea Islands and um, traveled to Paris and lived there for several years in the Beat Hotel during the 1950s. And when I learned that about her, she's one of the actors in, the, um, in this film. She was the middle-aged woman wearing the hat, talking about crabs, of course. <laughs> and, um, when I found out that this tall, beautiful black woman lived in Paris in the Beat Hotel at the same time as Allen Ginsberg and um, what's the naked lunch guy? Um, Burroughs. Uh, William Burroughs. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, but no one ever talks about that. Mm -hmm. That's important. It's yeah, important it's to me. Important. You know? So she was part of the beat literary movement. We see her in all the photographs, but no one mentions her by name. So after she did that, then she came back to the United States and she worked in the she was a part of the black power movement, the black arts movement, new black cinema movement, and the, she worked for 20 years as an NPR radio journalist. Um, talking about food as cultural memory. So that's a documentary that I have in progress right now. My other big project is Eleanor Roosevelt's Battalion, and it is about the 850 African-American women who served overseas during World War II. Yeah. <laughs> In Birmingham, Roy in France, and near the, I keep saying it wrong, and Andenay's Forest? Ardennes. Ardennes mm -hmm. Forest, yeah. Because mm -hmm. I only know it from reading it. I, no one said it out loud, so mm -hmm. Ardennes mm -hmm. Forest. Yeah. So uh, that's an uh, extended series, a mini series that I've been writing and researching over the last, pitching for the last seven years, and that's what I want to do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We're going to help you make that happen. Yeah. Um, okay, so now we're going to open it to the floor. Um, there are okay, you got around. one straight <laughs> right. here, and then we'll go there. And then we go here. Okay. Um, first of all, I would like to congrats uh, Mrs. Dash for um, her amazing movie and already for her new projects, especially the project about the black woman. Uh, not so well known because I think it's really interesting for our children and our daughters. Um, I know that um, her movie uh, inspired Beyonce Lemonade's album and I would like to know if, um, yes, did you have a, a, a true collaboration with uh, Beyonce and do you have perhaps uh, another project 
because I think that um, the, the fact that you use black womanhood like uh, you use it in your movie is really important for a black woman. I've never met Beyonce, but Arthur Jaffa, who shot this, uh, he shot several uh, music videos for Beyonce and also for her sister Solange. I met Solange. Solange um, arranged for Arthur Jaffa and myself to fly to New Orleans and to meet with her artist collective and the community in, um, in Louisiana. And we talked a lot about aesthetics and, and, and film and, and, and all of these wonderful things. So, no, I never met with Beyonce. I, I didn't know she was doing Lemonade, but when I saw Lemonade, I certainly appreciated it. It looked really beautiful and was very moving. Um, but there's no real connection other than it's, it's in the ether. It's, it's, it's these visual metaphors that we've all been working with for many, many years, and it's part of a continuum of the Black Atlantic and trying to tell our story in many various ways, various ways, yeah. Hope to see you soon in Belgium. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Hi, um, so I'm Eric. Um, thank you so much again for the movie and all I could think throughout this whole thing was how beautiful my sisters are, how much I love them. <laughs> so yeah, I love black women. And um, I was wondering, because I have two questions. Uh, no, first of all, I would just love all of you all, please, to just please applaud my beautiful sister, Lise, here for yes. making this possible. Thank you, Lise. <laughs> uh, <laughs> thank you. For more, for more than one year and a half, she's just been yeah. allowing us to see so much beautiful portrayals of our sisters yeah. and, and of ourselves. So just Absolutely. thank you for, for giving her that round of applause. Thank you for that email. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. So, so thank you so much. So... Um, my first question is, because um, so all this cinematography awards that you won for this, um, uh, I know because when I see today uh, shows like Insecure where um, Issa Rae and Yvonne Audrey's beautiful skin is just highlighted, it's beautiful, it's, in, like, it's beautiful. And you worked on um, Queen Sugar, yes. where you can see Rutina's, Rutina Weasley and Kofi Siriboy's beautiful skin being, it's like... I just, that's all I can think when I watch those that series. Like their skin is so beautifully highlighted and beautifully shot. And so when I was seeing that that movie as well, I was like, "This is nine. Like this is 1991." And for we all we actually this, shot it in 1989. Yeah, and all these years we've seen black skin, beautiful, like not being really well made up for movies, and not being well shot and everything. Very like so, I was wondering if you could tell us if you had to develop any new not not technology, but any new ways to highlight black skin for this movie, or if the that's something that you worked on to make sure that we were like everything was because I feel like back then not everything was remade for us. So if you could maybe tell us about that. And uh, my second question is also about. Um, Can I answer the first one? Yeah. <laughs> so I don't forget them. The yes. Um, I grew up always wondering why black skin on uh, in feature films was looking green or blue. I found it very disturbing because my relatives don't look green or blue. Mm. So, I want, so when I became a filmmaker, that was a major concern of mine. Um, so uh, I immediately went into testing film stocks and, um, and learned that, you know, at the time that the Kodak film read shadow areas as green or blue. And so therefore it was reading us as a shadow, so therefore we were green or blue. So I started using other film stocks. Um, I, I shot a lot on, on Fujifilm because Fujifilm tended to go toward the brown when it was reading shadows, and so I like that. For Daughters of the Dust, we used Agfa Javert film mm -hmm. because it had a lot of orangey undertones in it, and that was 35 millimeter Agfa Javert negative, which they don't make anymore and we don't use anymore because now we're shooting digital. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but uh, Arthur Jaffer and I, we, um, we experimented a lot, and he also, we did not use any artificial lights for several reasons. 
One, because uh, we could not bring them into the region because it was a protected region on these beaches and we couldn't, you couldn't bring anything that had four wheels. It could only be three wheels. <laughs> so we, it's like, yeah, well, we had to carry our equipment in every day. We shot on various islands, not just one. It was like five different islands. So um, Arthur Jayford um, created these handheld reflectors that we used, you know, warm tones and cool tones that he would use right off the frame, outside of the frame, we would reflect into the faces of the talent. Um, so that's why their skin looks so beautiful. Um, we, of course, we only shot during daylight because that's all we had, <laughs> you know. We never shot high noon, but we never shot between 11.30 in, in the morning and 1.30 in the afternoon. Now, a normal Hollywood film, they would not have that because you have to shoot, 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 shoot. You can't waste time. But we know the overhead makes an ugly image and the shadows go all in the wrong place. We wanted side lighting, so we shot early in the morning and we shot in the afternoon. Just because we were so concerned with how it looked on black skin tones, it was very difficult to shoot um, in the open air on white sand mm -hmm. with white dresses mm -hmm. and dark skin. So yeah, of course, yes, we studied Lawrence of Arabia, what they did out there in that desert. Mm -hmm. We studied, it was very, a lot of work went into creating the look that we have. It wasn't just haphazard, it wasn't, we weren't lucky and by chance. We had two cameras and, you know, there was a lot of humidity out there and, and the cameras kept breaking down and all kinds of things. So. It was, it was a difficult shoot, to say the least, to, but we got it done and I'm pleased with it. And yes, we spent a lot of time on choosing the right film stocks. Second question. Yeah, yeah so thank you, because when I'm uh, just saying, just when I say that, when we all say that Black Lives Matter, I think it also means that our representation, like the quality of our representation matters as well. So we all deserve to be just like, represented in the best way possible and thanks yeah, for we, we deserve to be able to see the faces exactly the features exactly. and the faces of the, the of the people who look like us yeah our melanin pop in in daylight it mm -hmm. deserves to pop on on the screen too so thank you um my second question was so um that's uh maybe some because i uh, i heard that a lot of people were kind of um, in, in America, black people were like distancing themselves from the people who come from those islands because there was like a difference. That, that's what I heard from you actually on Thursday. Um, and also it, uh, also about um, all these new like genetic tests that people are doing in America to know where they came from in Africa and everything. So I just wanted, if you could tell me, like anyone from America really just could maybe just tell me about how our, our brothers and sisters over there are really reconnecting to wherever they came from, whether it's from the islands or all the way back from Africa and how all of this is going and how they're um, approaching this, this, this journey of knowing where they come from and how they're reconnecting to all of that. Okay, let me answer the last one first. I am Congo, Cameroon, um, Mali, Senegal, British Isles, Scott Irish. <laughs> DNA. Uh, how are we connecting? We're still processing. Okay. Um, let's see. Um, the Geechee and the Gullah. Yes. Um, there was a hierarchy. And the Geechee and the Gullah people were the lowest on the rung, African Americans from the mainland, from Mississippi and Alabama and Georgia and what have you, Chicago, <laughs> they felt they were better than the Geechee and the Gullah because um, it was a misread. Mm -hmm. <laughs> After the Civil War, when the Union soldiers, you know, appeared on the islands to tell these people that they were free the war was over and they were free, they found the Gullah and the Geechee people to be very different from the people, from the African Americans on the mainland. They were, they were shocked. <laughs> they were shocked that they spoke differently, they walked differently, they spoke, oh, I said spoke, yeah, their religious practices were different. Um, cooking, traditions, everything was different. But, but what was different was they were acting West African. And that shocked them because it had been 400 years, right? 
So <laughs> they were wondering how, how is this possible? But it was because of retention patterns, you know? So they, they were isolated and insulated for so many years, so many generations, that they were still very West African. But as we know, it's not just one African country. There are many ethnicities and many languages and all of these things, and they were all of that combined. They did what they could to survive, but they were many languages, they were many ethnicities all combined, and that frightened a lot of people on the mainland. So they were considered like the lowest on the rung. And Julie, maybe you can add to that uh, what your grandmother grandmother told you when you told her you were going to name your production company. Geechee Girls Productions. She said, Pew. <laughs> she, said <laughs> um, she was not impressed. Um, I was told not to tell people I was Geechee. That I come to get to. Don't, just don't mention it. It wasn't that they were ashamed of themselves, but out in public we were told not to share that with the public, but at home it was fine and they could speak in the Gullah dialect and act like Geechee's and Gullah's, but outside. So that was, that was a confusion that I grew up with and so one of the reasons I wanted to do more research, which I did, and, and tell the story because there were so many contradictions growing up. You know, how could you be so full of pride when the doors closed and you're at home but if so, a neighbor comes in and then you know, like, no, man, we're we're American, <laughs> we're you know, we're just like you, <laughs> you know, anything but being Gullah and Geechee. We have another question. And a microphone here. Yeah, thank yeah. you. Mm -hmm. I'm Modine Tambwe. Yeah, I want Modine. to go on a touchy question. I find it's always a, a touchy question. Uh, making a film means having finance. And how do you cope with uh, having finance to do what you want? I'm asking this because uh, looking back, I'm from Congo, so I have a new sister there. Um, wanting to make films on uh, experience of the diaspora and uh, also films that relate lives uh, with when colonialism was on is quite uh, touchy and difficult unless you respond to certain patterns when it comes to subsidies uh, for films. You're allowed, you get the subsidies if you, you, you come up with stories that has a certain patterns and serve of a certain uh, content or image that is wanted to be promoted. And uh, I wonder how do you work that? Uh, can you share how you finance your films? Unless it's a big secret? It's no, there's no secret at all. Um, let me back all the way up. Filmmaking is a very expensive venture and it is, um, and you're always looking for money, begging for money and trying to get grants and trying to get someone to assist you in your production and you're trying to convince them that the story is great and it's going to sell and all of these things. Um, but every, every project that I do, everyone has its own, it has its own history. This particular film took 15 years for me to, not to shoot it, it took me 23 days to shoot it, but it took 15 years to raise the money. Other films, maybe not so much, <laughs> no much time. Um, the film that I'm talking about that I'm trying to do with the Eleanor Roosevelt's Battalion, it's been seven years since I first started trying to raise money. Um, I'll get a call to do a television commercial. It, it, you just fly there, prep it and do it, get paid. Coca-Cola. Mm -hmm. um, music videos, they're fast. I've done several uh, television movies, you prep them. Uh, six weeks and you shoot it. So this is a, was a passion project. This was a project of my own. This was a project that no one was telling me I have to include this or, or take something out or go in a certain direction or put a logo up, you know, have Nana holding a Coca-Cola can. <laughs> so, <laughs> so it took a longer time to finance. I'm not suggesting that you should go try to take 15 years to get something financed yourself, but what I would suggest to you is to go ahead and write what you intend to do, produce your own screenplay, and then go about crowdfunding, shooting par, shooting on the weekends, like my 
friend Charles Burnett used to do. He used to like for uh, six months, he shot on the weekends with friends and family and associates. Join workshops or go to school and work with like-minded people who will do barter services for them. You make sandwiches for their film, they do camera work on your film. If you have to do it that way. But to don't wait. Don't wait for someone to give you the money that you need to, to get started. Just get started. Um, and it's like that. It's like this for every filmmaker, black, white, or whatever. When you're working independent, it's very difficult. It's uh, risky, high venture, capitalist stuff. And, and then there's the thing of gender. There it is. <laughs> they seem to trust men with a camera more than a woman with a camera. Uh, but then now you could always tell them of the Patty, the Patty Jenkins success with Wonder Woman. You could talk about Ava DuVernay. You could talk about Dee Rees and Gina Prince Blythe would use them to say, look, these women have made some very successful films. Have made these, their films are made a profit. My films don't necessarily make a big profit, but you know they get made eventually. Um, write up a business plan and just get to work. Okay, De but don't be dissuaded by the fact that you may not get money right away. Sometimes you, even for this, I had to shoot a short trailer and then I was pitching the trailer. I made a 10 minute trailer of this and then I pitched it all around and people said, oh, that's what you're talking about. Oh, fundraisers, raises. I, I, we raised money all over the place, but eventually we, we got the bulk of the money from American Playhouse theatrical films. But it is, it, but these are better times. That was 1989. These are better times. You, you have digital cameras now. It's cheaper. We were working with film. That's very expensive. OK? OK, yeah, please. Yeah, thank you for that, that beautiful film. Um, uh, it's interesting to say that, um, that these are better times because I think uh, I can be a little bit romantic about a certain period. I, I think of that, um, that idea that every film's a documentary. And when I watched this film, um, of course I was uh, totally in, in the place that you wanted us to be. I was right there at the turn of the last century. But I also felt this beautiful, black, independent, uh, experimental alternative mood that seemed to be around in the in the 80s and, and 90s. I think in, in the UK we had the Black Audio Film Collective who were making uh, really avant-garde, interesting intellectual uh, cinema, which seems to have disappeared, but I don't know if it has, if, I, if I'm just being romantic about the past, or do, do you think that energy is still that there? Was, John, was that John Acompra? Yeah. yeah, 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 and Isaac Julian. And, yeah, and, yeah, I know them. Yeah, okay, yeah. And so, St. Colfer and, you know, yeah. So I just wondered if, if there really was a moment, uh, or if I'm just looking back on it with, uh, with romance, or, or if, if there was a moment, and, and, and if that moment still exists, or if it died out, and why it might have died out, and what it I was wouldn't, like. I wouldn't say that it died out as much as it has evolved. Like June Giovanni was part of it too, and now she has the Pan-African um, Cinema Archives in the UK. Um, Isaac Julian is now doing um, a museum work large-scale video projections. John Acomfer certainly and Lena are still producing. I mean, they did the, the, the Gilroy film too. Uh, yeah, the, yeah. Um, so I, it, it has evolved. Stuart Hall. Stuart Hall, mm -hmm. yeah. It has evolved and, um, and it's, uh, the magic is still there and now you have uh, digital technology to work with and so you don't have to spend as much money um, on um, on your independent film, so you know now is the time. It's a really a golden age in many ways with with Ava DuVernay and uh, and what she's doing. Um, and I know I keep mentioning her name, but be, Ava DuVernay yeah. did in six months' time. She changed the whole landscape of Hollywood. In six months' time, she made uh, she produced a TV series and hired all women directors. And Hollywood had not done that in its 100 years of existence. That's pretty remarkable. Yeah. Changed just like that. So now everyone's trying to hire women. 
and she hired women. She was inclusive. She hired white, black, Asian, Hispanic, everything. Just as long as you were female, you got hired. <laughs> you know? <laughs> My question is, uh, first of all, um, assuming that there's a momentum in this film among the U.S. audience, uh, considering the, the context, you may correct me if it's wrong or not. <laughs> I assume that it's gaining a lot of visibility once more. Um, under this assumption, it would be interesting to have your benchmark on um, yeah, the impression of people now versus... 25 years ago when it yeah, was 27 a, especially yes. it, those who don't have an African heritage that the yeah well this is a whole new generation I think a lot of people here probably were not born mm -hmm. in 1989 when we were shooting mm -hmm. um, so it's a whole new generation um, this film has been taught in colleges and universities all over the world for the last 27 years it's also uh, considered a national treasure. Yeah, the Library of Congress placed it in the National Film Registry in 2004. So, um, and just last year, the New York Film Critics gave it a special award for um, having been made. So, um, so don't be afraid of doing independent work. You, you know, it takes a long time to get recognition, but you will get recognition for your independent work. Um, I think in terms of people watching it who are not of African American descent, I think what it does is hopefully inspires you to say, well, she did this film and it's not even, it's non-linear, it's in the Gullah dialect, it's about an obscure culture in the Sea Islands of the South, and it has been in distribution in, for 27 years without stopping. So. Hey, <laughs> make your films, yeah. tell your stories, share your voices. Um, people will listen, people will come to see it, and people will appreciate you. So I think that's what it does, hopefully, continues to. Okay, I think, uh, do we have, we'll take one last question. One last question. Okay. Hi, Julie. <laughs> um, well, thank you for the film and thank you for your presence and collaboration with the festival. It was uh, fundamental. Um, just to continue the topic of, uh, you know, people that were not born in that period and um, uh, the film has been, it's so actual right now. I mean, it's, uh, the topics are <laughs> always actual. Oh, they will never change. Um, from your point of view, would you change something in it? Or uh, if you have the chance, would you make it in the same way? Oh, First that's very, such a good question. <laughs> and, um, the, and the second one. <laughs> that's me 27 years ago. Yeah. Mm. Um, so I wouldn't touch it now. It's just like, think of an artist who paints a picture. It's done, you have to walk away from it. You can't come every year and say, eh. Add a little bit. <laughs> I get this out again. Of course, it would it would be different. I'm a different person. I have a grown daughter now, so you know. Um, hopefully, I keep growing and evolving and learning and changing and expanding. Not just my weight, but expanding mentally. Uh, you know. So. Uh, <laughs> you. It would not be the same film. Uh, but I would never, never go back, of all the films I've made, I would never go back and touch it, you know, to edit it again, because you would be editing for the rest of your life, you know, let me fix this, let me fix that, let me fix this, let me fix that. It, that was that expression um, many, many years ago, and, and I've moved on from it, and I've, and I've done other things. So, um, but that's a very good question, because I think all artists, you know, when they look at something they've done before, I have a certain, there's a certain amount of distance I have from it, with it, you know, I look at it and it's like, oh, yes, yeah, like an old friend, but it's not like, oh, I remember the day I was shooting that scene. It's just, it's just an old friend that I like, visit sometimes. <laughs> and second question, uh, now in 2018, if you must do 
you know, if you have done the, the film now in 2018, uh, how would you do it? And um, and the, or how, what uh, what would be an um, an actualized version of the, your film now? In 2018. Uh, yeah. What would this be like? Yeah. Well, it would be um, a much faster shoot because we'd be shooting digitally. Uh, we wouldn't have this, the same lighting concerns. We wouldn't have the same. Um, the equipment is different. It's lighter. Um, we had to, you know, when we laid down dolly track to uh, do some scenes to create movement with the in the frame, uh, we had to shore it up and it and it kept sliding. I don't know if you're familiar with film, but it's very difficult to lay dolly track in the sand, the shifting sands on an angle. It's very difficult. You have to rig it a certain way. So we wouldn't have that problem because now we had jib arms. You know, there's so many things that are different that. Um, you know, the con many of the concepts would it would be more intense because I actually cut out things that um, that I would be able to include now and some of the things I couldn't shoot and some of the, it would it would be um, it would be different, but it would be the same. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Julie, for um, being with us this evening and being so um, so honest and clear and and joyful. Yeah. Um, I just want to thank Afropolitan Festival um, for this opportunity and for bringing Julie Julie here to see this piece of work, which is just magical. And I think it's the <laughs> if I can say it like that, this is this is. The first Wakanda. <laughs> so um, we go, we go now. But um, Jameson, I just give you the last word tonight, and uh, thanks for your participation as well. Absolutely. So I just want to take a moment to thank you, Lise, at recognition. The yes, Lise, once again, hand clap. <laughs> It started with an email to us at the embassy as well as an email to Julie. And uh, we couldn't be happier to be part of this. Uh, the Chargé spoke on Friday evening at the debate. Um, and it's just been a great opportunity for us to share our piece in this black Atlantic uh, element. Uh, it means so much to have Julie Dash here, to have Damon Davis here. Um, and it wouldn't be possible without local partners. So thank you to the audience as well for dedicating your Sunday evening. Uh, I was excited to have Julie Dash here. I've watched the movie, I think, four times in the past week alone. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, watched it with my kids and brought this to them as well. So I'm glad that we don't have to remake it or we don't have to make it in 2018 because you opened so many doors mm -hmm. in 1991, right? So to, to add, if I might add to your question, I feel like an, another layer to that is would we where would we be if that door hadn't been opened by Julie Dash's film, exactly. right? And so uh, thank you to everyone, and uh, we look forward to working with you down the road. Okay. Have a good evening. Thank you.